Hello, I'm James Agonix and welcome to Media Week. Ahead on the program, Fairfax shares spiked after a rumoured TPG takeover. We'll get the latest on that story shortly and how internet-delivered television is transforming the media landscape. Shane Keats from Akami Technology joins us a little bit later. Of course, my co-host James Manning, editor and publisher of Media Week, is here to take us through all those stories plus more. But first, advertisers are boycotting Google and YouTube with more than 250 companies, including the likes of HSBC and Johnson & Johnson, as well as Toyota, have already suspended their contracts, accusing the platform for allowing their adverts to appear next to controversial content. Well, we've got a special guest panel to discuss this issue, plus more. Vijay Solanke, CEO at IAB Australia, and John Miss Kelly, Chief Digital Officer at Group N, join us here in studio. Gents, appreciate your time today. Um, VJ, I might just start with you and look, how big an issue is this from the, the internet advertisers' perspective? Look, I think it's worth saying that brand safety is nothing new. <laughs> it's been with us since the beginning of media. If you think about, if you think about TV um, and, and a news channel where you might be creating content that is unexpected and an ad's running yep. next to it, if you think about a shock jock on a radio, etc. So this isn't, um, a industry, this isn't a digital topic. It's an industry topic. Um, I think the second point here is that brand safety means different things to different companies. You know, if you're a, a cheeky underwear brand versus a cautious insurance company, you may have a different view on where you want your brand to appear. Mm. I think the thing within the digital sphere is that there's a range of different types of publishers. And they have different approaches and different tools to where you can put your brand, um, all with good levels of uh, brand safety um, about them. So, yeah. I, I think the thing that's different for me is that the, the, safe, the, the safety has changed, though, hasn't it? I mean, it's not traditional publishers anymore. We're talking about a lot of user-generated content, which can be quite um, hateful, you know, uh, stuff that we haven't seen before. And this was often painted as the promised land, maybe, for advertisers, where you can get massive reach at low cost. I mean, is that something maybe advertisers haven't come to grips with properly, or...? Yeah, listen, from an advertising point of view, I think looking at TV metrics, there's always a need to try and chase reach. And YouTube, given its scale, is able to sort of offer quite low unit costs. But this has been a bit of a wake-up call for advertisers, I think, about where their brands appear and what the contextual relevance is against. So, there's a real balance between cost and quality, I think a lot of advertisers are looking at now, and I've taken a note over the last week or so. So you think this could have longer term ramifications for, for those brands that are particularly brand safety conscious? Yeah, listen, I think that brands will now look at what quality means. Yeah. Um, I think that it won't just be about cheap reach, but qual quality reach will come into play. And I think some brands will want to have an absolute cast iron guarantee that their ads are appearing in really safe environments. How much is programmatic sort of to blame for some of this too, where it's just, just left to a you know, mathematical formula to work out where I can get cheap spots and good reach? I think programmatic, what, what we've got to remember is it's sensible automation. I think that all, equally with programmatic, there are many tools and levers um, that advertisers and their agencies can use um, to decide where they want their ads to run and equally where they don't. Um, you know, there are various tools and systems that you can use to ensure high levels of brand safety. Yeah, but they haven't been used, it looks like, properly, or do we need some still, some a little bit more human intervention in some of these There's transactions? Not, in this particular YouTube example, you could, we could ring up YouTube and buy a, a campaign with a phone with your sales rep, and this wouldn't have been any different, or programmatic wouldn't have been any okay. different. So the, the, the core of the problem here is the fact that YouTube is so open sourced mm -hmm. and you know the majority of content is safe and you know, fine to run in but because it's so open sourced and users can upload videos and there's not complete vetting of all videos that um, this has happened and I don't think you can pin this YouTube issue on programmatic per se. Do you think, would you expect to see some sort of response from the platforms, be it YouTube or some of these other platforms that probably would go, oh goodness this is a bit of a reminder as to maybe we need to be a little bit more focused on, on where we're allowing ads to be placed or how open source we are. Listen, to Google's credit, they've reacted very, very well over the yeah. last couple of days. I've even had emails and my emails are walking in the door here about some of the updates they're making to the platform. So to their credit, they have put, they've acted very, very quickly to try and update some of the safety measures. But I think the point boils down to the fact that within these 
environments, it's, it's impossible to be 100% safe, just mm -hmm. given the open nature of the, of the platform. So I think what that means is that advertisers, and what's good about all of this, is it's making advertisers think about the nature of their brands, the audiences and the environments that they want to play in, and the level of investments that they want to make. The facts are that across Australia there's a range of different types of publishers, mm. um, and so they've got to think about where they want to be and what they want to invest. We see that certainly short term this doesn't seem to be a, will be a significant financial uh, pain for, for Google. Do you think there'll be brand damage there though, I mean, long term? I think it certainly has dented the credibility and the integrity of the YouTube platform, but make no mistake, YouTube or Google make most of their money from search advertising from a very, very long tail, so I don't think financially it'll make a huge difference. But I think advertisers will, it's, it's certainly dented their integrity a little bit. Yeah. And what about the sector, VJ? Do you think there's any... No, I mean, I come back to a very simple fact, and sometimes in these sorts of conversations and, and news stories, a simple audience has been forgotten, and that's the consumer. And the facts are that the time spent online by consumers in Australia has doubled in the last four years. We've got 20 million Aussies online every day, 15 million Aussies on their mobiles every day. So any smart marketeer is looking at where the audience is going, and clearly the audience is spending a lot of time in the digital space. Do you think that on behalf of some of the, um, the brands that there is sometimes a degree of oversensitivity? I mean, how many... Um, people who are watching YouTube in, the, in this case because uh, an ad for Kia or something like that is running against something that is against their messaging would actually draw a link between the two. I mean, does that actually really happen? Listen, there's a very, like, let's be honest, there's a very low volume of, of impressions running against this. One advertiser will be found it's four impressions. Yeah. So the volume is really low, but that being said, brands want to make sure that they're associated with premium um, safe content and it's just new brand wants to be associated with that, mm. irrespective of how small the chance of risk is. So I think it's fair for advertisers to be cautious around this. I think that's absolutely right, and I think John makes a really, really good point, which is to get into the data. Uh, how many, how, to what extent has this happened? So, we're, you know, we heard some anecdotal numbers there. I think we're on a mission now as the IOB to really put a, put a firm number on. There was one that was released today, I think, from IAS that showed um, you know, five percent, but we've got to really check and validate those numbers, and let's let's be sure that this isn't a storm in a teacup. Mm. Do you think we'll be seeing any other media sectors yeah. maybe taking advantage of this as as you know restating their their claim, their their safety, their environment over others? I'm sure the TV guys are <laughs> licking their lips at this. <laughs> um, highly viewable, brand safe environments with signed on. I think they'll be loving it. Yeah, yeah. VJ, do you think? I mean, I take your point that. It's unlikely consumer behaviour is going to change, isn't it? Because, I mean, there's audiences for some of this unsafe content, isn't there? I think it's less about that. For me, it's the fact that in Australia there's a range of different publishers um, and a lot of them offer fantastic environments that are incredibly brand safe. So I suspect um, you know, they'll be uh, trying to make the most of uh, this opportunity too. All right. We've got to leave it there. VJ Slanky and John Miss Kelly, appreciate you both joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. We are off to a quick break. When we come back, plenty more on Media Week, including how Akami Technologies is working with the major broadcasters and using internet-delivered television to transform the media landscape. Naughty. No. Mm. They're more teasers. Yeah. I love <laughs> Maltesers, the lighter way to enjoy chocolate. No. Yeah. No. Love it. Great. With outstanding quality, durability, reliability, safety, and service. It's no wonder we're Australia's number one forklift company. Toyota Material Handling. Solutions for every pallet. Autumn Racing is back. If you bet the championship's day one money back. Finish second or third in any race at Randwick, get real money back. Up to $50, money back. And if you don't back the winner, you bet. Gamble responsibly. Time to find your ideal hotel. Ready? <laughs> Type in where you want to go. With two clicks, select your check-in and check-out dates and search Hotel Trivago.
Jump into Woolworths this Easter. You'll find all chocolate bunnies now 20% off. That should make everyone happy. That's why I picked Woolies for Easter. <laughs> Cannot wait for the Masters. Day, Scott, Spieth,y Rory, Dustin Johnson. Are Fox Sports doing a Masters channel? Or we? We're live from Augusta. Yep, every round. And don't forget Stuart Appleby. Stuart Appleby's on the team. How good's Appleby? He knows he's not going, doesn't he? Oh. How good is the Masters? B thought that I was dead. Now I'm going to kill Ferguson. The only thing taking revenge will do is end your life sentence. The brand new season. The pain and the rage just simmering beneath the surface. One cannot deny the animal within. Wentworth, the new season, begins Tuesday 8.30 on Showcase. Sunday on Carvelis. Labor and unions want to rerun their electorally potent work choices campaign. Work choices laws have gone too far. Over penalty rates. No one's penalty rates are safe in this country. But will it skewer the coalition like it did back in 2007? ACTU President Jed Carney and small businesses Peter Strong battle it out. Plus, Assistant Minister for Multicultural Affairs Zed Seselja and Labor's energy spokesman Mark Butler. On the next Carvelis, Sky News Live. Welcome back to the program. My co-host, James Manning, editor and publisher of Media Week, of course, alongside me. More from James in just a second. Before, though, local and international OTT internet delivered through the television and VOD video on demand providers have created a fierce battleground in Australia. But what does it take to be victorious? My next guest focuses on how OTT is transforming the media landscape. Shane Keats, Director of Industry Marketing for Media and Entertainment at Akamai Technologies, has been in Australia presenting at an industry conference. Today, he's sharing insights derived from working at Akamai and does lead, as he does with leading OTT providers, including Channel 7, SBS, BBC, ESPN and Fox. Before working in software, Mr Keats spent seven years as a television news producer for NBC Nightly with Tom Brokaw and CNN Moneyline with Lou Dobbs. And I'm pleased to say Shane Keats joins us in the studio. Great to have you on board, Shane. Thanks for having me here. A lengthy introduction, but <laughs> <laughs> let's kick off with OTT and, uh, and VOD. And I suppose what you're seeing at the moment as the key drivers within within the, the industry? I, I think the key driver is that the consumer is changing and the consumer is demanding that uh, uh, television change with him and her. Mm -hmm. um, they've gotten a taste of what uh, uh, it's like to uh, have uh, video at their fingertips and they're now asking that from, uh, from all of their video providers, all of their content providers. <laughs> And that's having ramifications, yeah, for the the new media success in this space is having seems to be having real ramifications for the, the traditional inhabitants. Or... Absolutely. There is an enormous amount of money that's being made in the OTT market um, and that's uh, caused an enormous number of new entrants to, uh, to come into the space. Um, so you're seeing uh, here in Australia uh, folks like Netflix and Stan, of course, um, uh, but also the traditional broadcasters uh, offering uh, uh, catch-up services. Um, so uh, a real effort to uh, give that consumer what they want, give that viewer what they want, but that's creating, I think, a lot of, uh, of thrash in the market um, and a lot of really intense competition. Where does that lead then? I mean, where, where do you see that the space heading over the next few years, considering that level of competition between new entrants as well as some of the more established media companies who are looking to also play in the space? Well, let's be clear, first of all, that this market is growing and mm. growing really, really fast. Um, uh, and we look at it in terms of, of, uh, of view time, for example. And um, the amount of view time on um, uh, OTT services is continuing to creep closer and closer to that of traditional. And for my teenage daughters, for example, I think they probably already spend more time uh, on their OTT devices and their OTT services than traditional. Um, 
Uh, so, um, but I, I think as, as programmers, we, uh, our customers need to think about this in, in, in sort of a, what I think of as a holy trinity uh, to, to be able to compete successfully. And that's first to, to uh, deliver great content. I think that's table stakes, of course. You can't survive unless you've got shows, uh, personalities uh, that people want to watch. The second is you've got to have a great and compelling user experience. I think that that, um, that consumer has to really feel like they have control over how they're experiencing their media. And then the third thing, and this is a, a place where Akamai plays really uh, heavily, is in making sure that the quality of the video stream itself and the experience of that OTT uh, uh, stream is, is really good. And in some cases, we're better than broadcast, and in other cases, we're not, if we're being uh, candid with each other. Tell me, you mentioned uh, a lot of money being made. Is it sort of being made or being generated? Because there's a lot of debate about, you know, uh, Netflix's massive investments to, to build their audience. They spend a fortune on content, not making a lot of profit yet, but, but you look at their numbers and think, well, gee, there's going to come a point when they will become a real cash machine. Uh, we're seeing Stan, a newer entrant here. Again, it's in a bit of a startup phase still before they get there. Do you think we'll see this as a, as a real, really profitable sector eventually? I, I think so, but I, I think, James, that you make a really great point, which is that we are in the investment phase of, uh, or, or season, if you will, of, new, of, of this story. Yeah. And that means that uh, companies have to invest very heavily uh, both in content, um, uh, but also in uh, the infrastructure it takes in order to deliver uh, a really compelling experience to the end user. And just on the, on the content side, I mean, James, sort of referencing the mega um, dollars that are being invested, particularly in, in dramas and, and so forth, and made for content. What about live events? What's, is, is that a big part of the future, streaming live events? I mean, we're already sitting, you know, a platform like Twitter, for example, you know, live streaming events. I mean, is that something you see happening, Olympics, World Cups? World uh, Series, those sorts of things. It's a great observation. And, and, and in fact, if, if you think about this in terms of season, season one was uh, on demand. Yeah. And season two really is, is the advent of live on the internet. Um, Akamai uh, does, because of our scale, uh, a lot of uh, folks who have live rights to things like the Rio Games or um, the Melbourne Cup come to us in order to be able to make sure that um, uh, they won't fall over when the crowds hit that. Mm. Um, uh, that video provider. Um, we're also seeing a lot of programmers uh, move to doing what we call a live linear stream of their 24-7 broadcast, their traditional broadcast on the internet, seeing a lot of that in the States and Europe. Um, and uh, that's a really complicated undertaking. So um, it requires a real new, uh, a, a new skill set um, and uh, has a lot of challenges. Shane, we've just been talking a little bit in the previous segment about YouTube and the, the challenges they're having at the moment mm. with some of their advertising. But, but for someone who monitors web traffic and, and all that sort of stuff, how, how big are they? How much of the, uh, the pipes do they, do they use up? And is that something that, uh, that start-ups need to, newer players need to contend with, you know? But... Well, YouTube itself is an enormous, enormous player. Globally, I, I wouldn't put it past, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they consume 20% of the world's uh, video uh, bits on a given okay. day. It's really quite extraordinary. Advertising supported services um, are, are about half of the OTT market. I know we talk a lot about Stan and Netflix and the, the, the SVOD business mm -hmm. model, the subscription mm -hmm. business model, but advertising is really a major piece of this puzzle. And if we don't solve it and solve it really well, I think we're, we're going to hinder the industry. Right. Yeah. Shane Keats, got to leave it there. A pleasure to have you on board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shane Keats there from Akamai. We are moving on because rumours are flying on a potential takeover of Fairfax Media by TPG. Here's the latest from Ben LeBrun from Options Express. Well, news continues to circulate that uh, Fairfax is in play and the name that keeps coming up time and again is private equity consortium TPG. And there's been speculation that TPG actually holds uh, a stake in Fairfax just under 5%. So we watch the news flow very, very closely now. As uh, rumour has it, TPG has been in talks with a lot of different media organisations, including Seven and including Nine, uh, amongst many others, of how they can hive off assets because what they're after in domain is the jewel in the crown. They're after the, the domain online property asset, uh, which has been valued at $2 billion. Uh, Fairfax has a market capitalisation of around $2.5 billion, so it means that they need to hive off around $500 million. And, of course, they might be up against the clock as well because Fairfax has 
plans uh, coming out of last earnings season is to spin off uh, that domain property asset. So uh, we continue to watch the news flow very, very closely. It certainly has not done the share price any harm at all. And of course, private equity consortiums are notorious bottom feeders, but it appears TPG has certainly missed the boat in terms of the bottom last year. Uh, Fairfax late last year trading around 80 cents, but the shares certainly running on the speculation that there is a, that, that it is in play and that a takeover is imminent. As I said, we continue to watch the news flow very, very closely. All right, let's get the thoughts of my co-host, James Manning, editor and publisher of Media Week. It seems like a story that's been bubbling along for a while, but certainly gaining some traction in the, in the form of TPG. Yeah, look, absolutely. They seem, and, and as was mentioned then, you know, the price has been drifting up a little bit. So there, you know, could be a payday for some long-term uh, Fairfax shareholders. You haven't had a lot of joy over the years. No. Uh, especially recently. But to me, the whole background of this is those media laws, you know. To me, this might indicate there's possibly some movement there. We've seen uh, Wynn and Southern Cross Stereo also come to agreement over selling that uh, mm. northern uh, New South Wales TV assets, $55 million. Bucks. Again, it seems to be maybe the market is now getting sort of some anticipation that we could be getting closer to seeing those media laws passed. To me, because, you know, we've, we, it's been hard to get excited about it because there was so we roadblock so after roadblock. Yeah. But now that the market seems to be moving, that to me is a clear indicator that we might be making some ground there. Uh, Fetch launching a multi million dollar ad campaign. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about Fetch on the show before. You saw the Fetch TV. I think they've dropped the TV bit. Now they're just calling themselves Fetch. They haven't gone out and done a lot of marketing. They've left that up to their ISP partners mm. uh, in the past, particularly Optus, who's a, their single biggest partner and brings them a lot of their traffic. So we've and we've talked recently about they've what they call skinny bundles. They're six dollar channel packages. That all? Yeah. So it looks very attractive to the consumer. You can get in there and for, for you know under thirty dollars, you can get a pretty large package of channels. Some of the channels which used to be just the domain of uh, Foxtel, I think, so they're, they're realising they need to spread their revenue base and they're starting to offer their content to other people. So it'd be interesting to see how Fetch develops. Uh, some numbers when it comes to the music industry and, and revenue growth. Um, where's the revenue stream strongest? It, exactly that, the streaming, the um, music streaming. It's, it's not the biggest part of it, but it's, it's something like 90% growth year on year. So they're big numbers and they're starting to gain some momentum. And it's a, sort of good news for the music industry, which has gone through a lot of digital pain. There's still a considerable, um, if you like, the CD market is still there, still People selling. People still buy still CDs. Still buying CDs. And vinyl is on the increase. <laughs> Vinyl's had a second year of growth. It's still a small part of the uh, sector, but it is, you know, there are fans out there for vinyl and it's growing. But I think streaming is uh, long term. If they can just keep that momentum going, it'll solve uh, a few of their challenges. And just quickly, um, it doesn't get any easier for Seven West, another media, another employee, I should say, taking legal action. Yeah, look, a former on air uh, news presenter who was on, I think, the this has been played out pretty publicly in the media with both parties talking to the media their cases. Someone who was on maternity leave, um, seven stories, look, they were offered another position. The, I think the news presenter says, yeah, look, that, that wasn't part of our deal, so I think that one's going to play out in court. And Seven's track record is, look, they don't settle on these cases uh, un unless it's really not going in their favour. So we can see that uh, a few more steps before the courts, yeah. A little bit more on television. Uh, Logie nominations announced. Only one woman nominated for the gold. Yeah, look, uh, Jessica Murray for her work on, I think, Love Child for the Nine Network, otherwise the Five Guys. A lot of talk about, can you have a quota on those things? Look, I don't think you can. I think it's... Well, it's, it's up to you and I. It's up to the public. Exactly, yeah. And if the public vote all women, all men, you know, I, I think that's just the way the numbers fall. Where you can do things is like the uh, Hall of Fame. I think the TV yeah. Week Hall of Fame. You can have... there's has been under-representation of women there. There's plenty of potential candidates in the sector. And you could do something, well, let's catch up, let's do two a year, make sure one of them's a woman every year. You know, just get the numbers a bit more balanced as they should be. And is there a more fiercely competitive space than breakfast television? We've got road trip galore coming from <laughs> sun, Sunrise and Today. I know, and these, both these announcements came out on the same day within minutes of each other. So Seven's going on what they call as a world first. They're going uh, across the United States. Didn't they do that a couple of years ago? They did, but the interesting thing about this is the viewers will vote for the city they to visit each day. So Sunrise will find out, I think, 24 hours before they've got to be at their next destination where they're going. So if they're in, you know, Seattle one day, 
and they, the viewers might say, oh, we'd like you to be in Miami. They've got to get there the next morning. Sounds like so a logistics nightmare. So a bit nightmare. of interest. Yeah. Oh, my God. So it's a challenge. And the Nines Today show, um, not quite so challenging. They're just going to be travelling around Australia pretty much uh, along the East Coast. All right, let's get to the all-important ratings. Uh, kicking off with free-to-air ratings. Uh, this, of course, for week 12, taking out the number one and number second and number third spot. Married at first sight. I know we've spoken about it for the last couple of weeks, but goodness me, this has been a winner for nine. I know. It's amazing we're tracking this, and we're going to see next week again, I think, we'll, a bit of a uh, spoiler. We'll see MKR resurging again. So they've really been... It's really been a, uh, a brawl there to get those bragging points for number one. Yeah. Uh, taking a look over at subscription television... Well, these are the... Um, from 6 to 10, my kids Yeah, again, rules. MKR there, you know. it's yeah, either, no, If you get those big franchises, those really dominate, huh? franchises, that's, that's what you need. Let's take a look at subscription, subscription at television. Week 12, uh, NRL, because this we sort of posed this question last week as to yeah. who was likely to come out, the NRL or the AFL. And there's our answer, two of each, really, in the yeah. top, top five, you know, uh, plus a bit of cricket. Love to so see a bit, of, bit of everything yeah. there, you know. Disappointing ending, but a great series. Yeah. Next page, six to ten, Goggle Box, Selling Houses Australia, The Late Show with Maddie Johns, uh, Professor in Second Year Syndrome and Real, Real Housewives in Sydney. Yeah, look, doing very well. And the Goggle Box, that series nearly at an end, a bit of a debate in our office this week. Could Goggle Box run year-round, you know? Is there... Are there enough fans to watch it every week? I think there probably are. Oh, I'll have to wait and see. James, yeah. pleasure as always. Thank you very much. Thank you. James Manning, the editor and publisher of Media Week. That is it for the show for this week. Thanks very much for watching.